Everybody okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. If you would, that'd be great. So we're on a different subject now. We're on suicidology. So uh, as I start this again, I, I think that we can agree that um, suicide has impacted many, if not all people, uh, either directly or indirectly. So with the topic of the subject, if, it, if it's one that's fresh for you, if it's one that you're uh, dealing with, uh, maybe this course isn't for you today. And uh, do have the wisdom to, if you need to, to get up and leave. And if you do leave, Nancy's probably going to follow you outside and just make sure that you're okay. And, uh, <laughs> and then afterwards, if you need to talk with somebody or pray with somebody because it does stimulate um, some response, please do come up and talk with myself or Nancy or somebody else um, who's not having a response to that. And uh, please make sure that you leave here in better condition than you came, okay? So the course on suicidology, the study of suicide, I want to start by doing this. Go ahead and break up again in groups. I'm going to give you five minutes, and I want you to, in that five minutes, give me a definition of what suicide is. <coughs> so you got five minutes now. Uh, come up with a definition of a group, three to four people at the most, and then just come up with what is a suicide. Is that suicide? Or begin to take the treatment options no. and say, I don't want to do this anymore. No. I know it's going to make me die, but... I don't like, is that suicide? No. Does that challenge any of our definitions? No. And, it, and it does. If you listen to some of the definitions, it does. So one of the problems we've had about teaching on suicide is that we can't have really to a common definition amongst most groups. Right. Um, and I will tell you that is a barrier between us actually moving forward and helping with suicide and even creating common language. You know, some of you might be, okay, that, that's nitpicking. It is nitpicking, but... Let me tell you that I have been to a lot of suicide trainings, and I trained several different suicide trainings. And what you're going to find is that there is a diversity, a plethora, a cornucopia of information on suicide. And a lot of it doesn't look like the clinic you went to before. It doesn't look, as a matter of fact, it will contradict what another clinic said. Another uh, speaker or presentation, there will be some similar threads in there but there's some differences, and, and so I want to pose to you the question of why? I mean, why are there different threats? And I, I'm going to give you a couple different ways to uh, hopefully think about this and to approach this because it really matters. Um, when we're talking about suicide, the first thing is, is that the study of suicide actually wasn't intensely studied until the American Association of Suicidology was founded in 1968. So when we're talking about an intense study of suicide, it's, you would call it a relatively new field. And so we're learning more as we're going, and that's certainly one of the pieces in here. So a lot of personal experience, but not an in-depth study to say, you know, what is suicide? Why does it happen? Um, what can we do about it? Relatively new. But likely the two most significant factors are what I want to approach here in this first part of this training. I want to talk about the difference in target groups and the difference in belief systems. And when you go to suicide training, those two things will impact the content of the training for sure. Okay, so we're just going to deal with the first uh, different target groups and then we'll come to different faith systems. The first target groups, I want you to think about this. most people who deal with suicide deal with a particular segment of society. Uh, age groups, uh, demographics by experience, uh, by training, um, by uh, war. Uh, so they're going to have a foundational piece that can be a, a more of a causal agent in suicide. And it's going to be focused on a group. Let me give you a few examples. Young persons. We've seen a 60% increase in Gen Z, which I believe now is 11 to 24, yeah. uh, in females in the last year. 60% increase. That's a pretty big increase. Right? Um, if you are paying attention to that, CDC says we have a healthcare crisis with kids. Well, we had it the year before, too, because we had a 40% increase. So over two years, we had a 100% increase. And there's a new clinical term for Gen Z. Clinical term. Doomerism. If you've not heard the term, you should look it up. It's called doomerism. And what you're experiencing with this Gen Z and, and others, but uh, I will say it really hits their group hard from what we're seeing statistically, is that they believe that the, everything is going to cry in the handbasket and there is no hope. Yeah. 
So uh, statistics will bring you back to things like Greta Thunberg, who says, you know, the, you know, in five years, and said this in 2018, in five years, uh, the Earth is going to die. It's going to be uninhabitable because of global warming or climate change or whatever. Uh, she had to erase all those posts in 2023, just recently, when there was a big kerfuffle about it. Because I don't know about you, but it looks pretty good outside. And uh, you go back to Leonard Nimoy in 1968 and 69, and he was saying. A global freeze is coming. We're all going to die. And he, you know, they show pictures of the Statue of Liberty and said, within the next five years, water will be up to the elbow. And I've just recently looked at a picture of the Statue of Liberty, and the water's <laughs> in the same place it was. It hasn't changed. But the message that keeps coming out to them uh, from certain political figures and uh, social activists is, it's over. You've lost. Bummer. And so the feeling that they have, and if you deal with that age group of kids, you're going to hear it. Why get married? Why have kids? Why bother getting good grades in school? Why, why should I care? We're all going to die. Yeah. Um, so doomerism is really high, and that's why clinicians have now determined that that would be a good term for Gen Z. So now, let's say that I'm a chaplain, and that's my focal audience. Or if I'm a presenter, and I'm teaching suicide, and I'm teaching suicide about Gen Z. The causation of suicide in Gen Z is going to be different than it is in another group. Uh, for example, Gen Z being younger, and I think there's a great correlation between the end of high school and coming into college where we see a lot of suicide. I can't keep up with my parents' expectations. I think I'll let everybody else down. What I've been told is unless I get this degree, I'm a loser and I can't get a good job. Uh, and so there's a lot of Wow, my friend went into the military, and the, look, their college is paid for. Now I have $120,000 in debt. Or, hey, my friend went into college, and I had a baby, and I started a family, and I don't have any of that background. So there's a lot of this message in their head. There's no hope, there's no hope, there's no hope. So if I'm going to go speak to that age group of people, I, I need to know what is the causation behind hopelessness, behind depression over certain situations. So, for that group of people, they don't have history. You know, when you're 16 and the person you're dating is the, you know, my, my soulmate, this is who I'm going to marry, and uh, it doesn't last. Well, they haven't survived maybe another breakup, especially with their soulmate. No. They don't know from past experiences. They can't go back and tap that resource and say, well, I've been through other hard things. I know how to get through this. So the way that I'm going to approach Gen Z would be different than the next group. Let's say that I'm going to deal with emergency responders and military personnel who have had an overexposure of traumatic events. Uh, what's, what's the problem for them? Their, their amygdala, the little the smoke alarm went off way too many times, kicked up the hippocampus where they're pulling in all this data of trauma, trying to process it. They got a couple dozen stress response chemicals dumping in their head over and over and over again. And what we find is the hippocampus that does a lot of that trauma processing and pulls in the information shrinks. As a response to overexposure to trauma, it shrinks, it, it reduces in size. And as it shrinks, PTSD potential raises. Okay? So now I'm talking with this group of people, and then they're going to come back into uh, civilian life, and they don't have all those chemicals dumping in their head. The ones that got them up, the ones that got them moving. The ones that got them through some of the trauma parts because the chemicals in your head dump and are powerful. So if I approach them, now I've got to talk about a different causation and different life experiences because that's what's going to help restore some of their hope and some of their ability to cope and function and be able to do okay. Right? So I have to know that. Now let's go to the elder. If I go to elderly people who until... Somebody go check. Somebody's got it. Somebody just walked out. Somebody just go check on them. Yes. Chapel, you grab them. Thank She's you. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. So um, elderly people. Uh, we look in our group, and until just recently, it was 55 and older white males who were at the highest numbers of suicides in our nation. Uh, Native Alaskans, Native American Indians, the highest per capita. But again, 55 and older, and then it bumped up to 65 and older. And what we see is uh, elderly people in suicides, uh, which aren't often talked about, unfortunately, when it's the larger segment, should be the group that we were saying, well, what's causing those suicides? Well, it's, can't hear me? Okay. Did it stop? Did my microphone stop? Yeah. Okay. 
I'll switch over to this other one really quickly. And I'll talk really loud in between as I'm switching. So as we're dealing with the elderly population, what, what's the causation in the elderly population? Well, loss of autonomy, right? I used to drive, I drove this road before anybody else was even here, before they put this stoplight. I don't need to drive this way. And then you lose your driver's license. Or, you know, when you had healthcare injuries and you used to break and mend, and now you break. I mean, can we all re relate to that? Can you hear me okay now? Did that kick back in? Okay. So what we find is um, there's different causation. I've lost people. You know, when do you start reading the obituaries? When you're either a chaplain or a trauma worker or when you get elderly and your friends are dying, right? And so if I'm going to have a conversation about suicide or a training, with elderly people, my topic and solutions have to be different because the causation is different and the remedy is different. And so I think what's happened is when we talk about suicide, there's a lot of inaction and a lot of confusion, especially as people are searching for information because somebody might lose an elderly person and they go to a teen suicide training. Or they have military personnel and they end up with um, an elderly person suicide training. And it's true there's some variables that are across over 100%, without a doubt. But we need to know that there is uh, some confusion in the training and the methodology of handling suicide prevention and intervention for loved ones afterwards because sometimes we're just focusing on the wrong group or we're going to a training that doesn't really pertain to our target audience. And some of you as hospital chaplains, your target audience might be all of the above. And you need to know the distinction between how you're going to handle each one of those. Yeah. What are the pieces that they need? Is all of your training, teen suicide training? Well, you're going to need some different training to deal with the group that you might spend the most time intervening for. Does that make sense? Are we all, you picking up what I'm laying down? No. Okay, we're all on the same page? Okay. Yes? Do you think you can hold on to the mic? I can. I can, I can work it out. It's so much better. I kind of feel like very like that. We don't want to miss a <laughs> All right. So, um, so that's our different groups of people. And, and I would just say, I think it's really important for us to just pay attention to that. Make sure whoever your target audience is, and if it's multiples, then you've got to get trainings in those multiples because the solutions are different and the causation is different. Um, so we'll come back to that. The next is uh, number two that I told you that will impact your understanding and your action in helping people either prevent suicide or families and loved ones recover after a suicide is faith-based beliefs. And they're different. And I think that's really important for us to understand culturally as we're dealing with people with suicide because not even all cultures look at uh, suicide the same. Even the church depending on your uh, body of belief, your denomination, uh, where you stand, won't look at suicide the same. And I think we have to have that as a really important piece. You know, you don't want to go into a home where somebody says, you, you know, they're a Christian, and you say, well, you know, every believer goes to be with God, even after suicide. I believe that's true 100%. I'll make a case for that all day long. But do you know that there are some people inside Christian circles who don't believe that? They absolutely just don't believe that that's a reality. They believe it's an unforgivable sin. And again, I'm very passionate about that. I'd love to have that conversation with anybody who wants to have that conversation. Um, I had a pastor who had showed up to a meeting for an outreach that we did locally for about four and a half years. And he showed up and we were having this conversation. He got so angry because his granddaughter or grandson, like a two-year-old, died. And we were talking about the fact that when you die before you can know, uh, that you go to be the Lord. And he was so mad because he didn't believe that was true. And so he fought the fact that his grandchild was in hell. And I thought, wow, what an interesting and awful viewpoint. Um, but it was really adamant. It was a passion. And I'm like, what? I don't know why you're passionate about that. Uh, I'd like to, to talk with you about that. But you know, to have a theological conversation with somebody who's emotionally bleeding isn't always the time to do that. And so uh, we, had a, we had to pinch that for a later time. But do know that with inside of these different groups, there are, there are different feelings about suicide. Let's just talk about it. Um, I believe that the Bible very clearly says that there's one sin that is unpardonable. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is to deny the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. To deny what God has done for us and the only way of salvation that God came in flesh and died in our place. I believe that's the truth. 
Because that's what the Holy Spirit's job is, to testify of Jesus Christ. So I don't believe suicide fits in there. Um, but some people do. And so you've, you've got to kind of walk into that, realizing that especially on the day of death or when the trauma has happened, this is not a time for a theological debate. It's a time to be present. Remember our three boxes, 911 chaplains, uh, ministry of presence. Later on, one to ten days in, still dealing with trauma and processing. Afterwards, great times as you're creating relationships to have theological conversations and help. Unless you think somehow that conversation, you can't go anywhere until that conversation happens. Realizing that you could still lose because people hold beliefs strongly, even if you could argue very theologically out of the Bible that they're incorrect. Everybody agree to that? Yeah, not quite the time. So at home, I'm going to give you three articles to read because there's so much information to go through. Um, and you'll see them down here. It's under gotquestions.org. And uh, I'm sure there's more in there, too. There's more articles. But if a Christian commits suicide, is he, she saved? So you can read on that yourself. You can go to the Bible verses, and you can run through them. And I think you should know them as a chaplain. Because I'll tell you, I get this question around suicides more than anything else. This is the question. Are they saved? And um, I think you better have a good theological way to answer this question. Let me tell you in a nutshell how I answer that question. I say, well, do you know if they ever profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? And if they say yes, I say, well, you know what? 1 Corinthians 13 tells me love hopes all things, believes all things, and endures all things. And in 1 Corinthians, what we understand is Paul, Paul calls them the carnal Christian believers. Carnal Christian believers. One sleeping with his mother-in-law. We think it's a mother-in-law. Uh, they're having fights. Uh, they're dividing the church. They're getting drunk at communion and keeping the poor people from coming in and having a meal. And does Paul say they're not believers? No, he calls them carnal Christian believers. That's what he calls them. And he says, later on in 15, uh, 13, love hopes all things, believes all things, and endures all things. That's not my realm. Salvation's not my realm. But my realm is to believe when somebody says that they've trusted Jesus Christ for life to believe. And so I'm going to rest on that because that's not on my side of the dial. So let's, let's rest and trust in what God has done because if Lot was called by God righteous Lot whose soul was vexed because of the things going on in Sodom. And he, he's in the hall of faith. The, you, you, know, you know Lot, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. The one who, after governing in the city, we get the word sodomy from, and then got both of his daughters pregnant and ended up with two different tribes that were Israel's enemies the rest of their life. Righteous Lot, whose soul was vexed. We know that faith is the answer. Faith. And when people say, I don't know, and I'll say, well, this is what I do know, that my God loves people, and he chases them to the end. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened or didn't happen, but I know this. I'm going to believe in faith because nothing else is going to change the outcome right now at this point. So I'm going to believe in faith. But what I'm going to ask you is, what will your family know when you die? And I just turned the question back. So I think these are important things to know, but those three articles can help you. You know, what is the Christian view on suicide? What does the Bible say about it? Uh, why should I not commit suicide? I think they're very good. I hope you'll do some study uh, and look those up if you want to. And you can find a plethora of other information, but I think it's a good starting place if you don't have a theology on uh, suicide and salvation. Because you, you need that answer, I think, for sure. Um, I pulled back to theology a lot of suicide at the right time. Um, in the end, it's our sin or the sins of others that causes people to be brought to a place where they feel hopeless. And if you don't know this, this is the difference. Helpless is I have a problem that I can't solve right now. People are in trouble in that place for sure. We've all been in trouble at certain points. Hopelessness is I have a problem nobody can solve ever. Now, they're not going to say that to you. I'm hopeless or helpless. You know, that, they're not going to give that terminology, but you have to be listening for the cues. Am I helpless or am I hopeless? I have a problem nobody can solve ever means that we need to ask a question at some point. We'll come back to that in a minute. But really, what we know, Jesus is the one who forgives sins. And so it's the sin of others, the sin of ourselves, and if we can, in suicide prevention, I still think Jesus is the greatest answer because he can make a new creation. He can wash us and make us brand new. Right? So different cultures, as I was telling you, look at suicide differently. Do you remember um, some cultures believe that suicide is honorable? Uh, you shame somebody, you shame the, the, the business, uh, 
or whatever it is, suicide's the only honorable way to look at it. So you have to know culturally amongst people too, what is their past? Maybe they even viewed in the past that suicide was honorable, but now they don't. And I think cultures change even in suicide. But as you're talking with groups of people, you need to try to get a feel and an understanding for what their cultural understanding might be around suicide. Is it honorable? I've heard a lot of elderly people say to me, well, the reason I attempted suicide or why I'm thinking about suicide is I just know my family, you know, they have kids now and they have games to go to and they, they have a beach house that they never get to go to because they're caring for us and they should be at the games and they should be at the beach house and they, they should have the freedom to not be here and just constantly being taken care of me. I've heard that one a lot. Isn't that saying culturally what I believe is that I'm a burden, not a blessing? Um, so you know, sometimes that's what we can do in the place where we love people until they ask why and then we tell them. Uh, but we've got to win them by love first in order to have the opportunity to tell them about Jesus in many cases. So, cooking along. We are now on page two. And I want to talk about another thing that's really important. And I'm going to, we're going to play a video here in just a second if you're ready to prep that. It'll be just a few minutes in. Um, I want you to understand the role of depression because this is another piece. Uh, I remember one of the first suicide trainings I was asked to be a speaker at. Uh, we had a rash of suicides in junior high and high school age kids in an adjacent county. And uh, I was asked to be on a panel with a bunch of other speakers. And I heard some things that I was really troubled by with a couple of the other speakers. And one of those statements was, every time there is a suicide or an attempted suicide, mental illness is always a factor. And I don't agree with that at all. And I want to make my case to you on that because I think it's really important. And I hope you understand this. When we talk about depression and suicide, I will say that everybody who attempts suicide at some point or the other has some type of depression. But is it always mental illness? Um, and I think we, we, we can get off the track and we can actually lay some burdens on some people if we assume that there's one causation in depression. Uh, so we wrote an entire course that we teach in our chaplaincy program called Understanding Depression. We talk about different types of depression. But here's the two that I hope you'll let me give you that are in very basic form. You're not going to find this in the DSM-5 um, because they're, they're really classifying two things. So if you, everybody know what the DSM-5 is? Yeah. Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Care Disorders, 5th edition. So that's where we classify and you can go through the criteria to be diagnosed with different types of mental illness. I will, I'm going to divide it in a much simpler term. There are clinical depressions, things that you will find in DSM-5, and there are situational depressions, which you will not find in DSM-5. So, clinical depressions, we can get that. Bipolar 1, bipolar 2, seasonal affective disorder. Um, we talked about postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, major, um, major depressive disorder. We've talked about some of these already. And you can find those prevalent inside of a community that might consider suicide. And I would say the bipolar one is one that leads us there along with postpartum psychosis most frequently to uh, thoughts or ideation of suicide, maybe attempted suicide. But to say that every person who thinks about suicide and attempts suicide means that there's gonna be some history of mental illness where the brain isn't doing its job correctly and it needs some assistance, right? That's not true. I believe that when we're talking about situational depression, that's what we as chaplains deal with more than clinical depression. We deal with situations that cause people to respond very rashly or quickly um, and maybe consider suicide where suicide has never been even thought about before. It has a quick, rapid onset. Let me give you an example, Great Depression. You had people who were business leaders and they were in their high towers and places of work and everything fell apart. And what did they do? They jumped out the window. They went on the roof, jumped off the roof. Have they ever thought about depression before? I, I, I believe that a good percentage of them never have. And a lot of the suicide call-outs I've done, um, and I've done a lot of them, I've done a ton of them, um, I will say the majority of them are situational depressions, not clinical depression. What we've learned about situational and clinical depressions is that people who have clinical depression might attempt suicide more often 
but not use as lethal means. They tend to survive more frequently than people who have situational depression, who when uh, hit by a very hard situation, go immediately to lethal means and die. That's statistics. You, I can, you can't argue that with me. That is the statistics we have. That's just reality. Uh, I'll give um, a few examples as, as we go along. So we had a uh, mom, and uh, I get called, and it's, a, it's like December, it's snowing outside, it's absolutely freezing. And uh, I get called because she is in a domestic violence relationship, uh, doesn't speak English is what I'm told, has a seven-year-old and a 14-year-old daughter and a husband who's the perpetrator. And I'm called because the, the mom left with the police department, local police department, to go to a domestic violence shelter. The seven-year-old went with her. The 14-year-old stayed back because she could speak English and actually played the parental figure. And so she wanted to be with dad, so she stayed. Uh, mom was barely down the road. Dad went into their bedroom and shot himself with a shotgun and died. So I get called, and there's uh, 911 chaplains on the scene, and they said, hey, um, we just need you to come if you can because well, we think mom is suicidal. I said, yeah, let's go. So I went and made a suicide assessment. I walked into the house, literally no heat. The heater didn't work. It was a rented house. It was a slumlord type thing. It was colder inside the house than outside the house. And the seven-year-old is crawling on mom, crying convulsively like a jungle gym. I mean, she's up and down around, back and neck and up and over her head and over and on her lap. And, and mom is a popsicle. She does not want to talk to her. Uh, she'll turn away. She pushes her away. Um, and her message over and over again was, take my kids and get out of here. Take my kids and get out of here. What that is, is that situational depression. What we had is multiple stress response chemicals dumped in her head because of trauma. And I call that a trauma-induced suicidology, or a suicide ideation. And so what we know about that is all those stress response chemicals in the head are going to last anywhere from a couple hours to up to about three days. That's about the max. And then they're going to start to dissipate and move out of the system. So sure enough, she was suicidal. And we said, no, can't do that. She can't be left here alone. Uh, she had a sister who was married. They came and picked them up. I said, hey, you've got to put her on watch 24-7. We're going to do this for three days. She can't go to the bathroom by herself. She can't go to the shower by herself. She can't go on a walk by herself. She can't have 30 seconds by herself. Um, can you do that? Can you accomplish that job? And they're like, yeah, she won't have it. So uh, three days on a watch. And she, I still won't touch her kids. And we're intervening. We're the CISM team, one to 10 days. We're coming back to that house and doing interventions with the sister and her husband. And we're doing interventions with the two girls. Day three, I'm there, I'm talking with a 14-year-old, she's sitting on the couch. Mom comes out, sits on the far end of the couch. Still as cold as a popsicle. Hasn't cried a tear, hasn't said a thing, hasn't hugged her kids, hasn't talked to them at all. I'm talking to the 14-year-old, we're going through our process. Every once in a while, mom would move a bottom's length closer. And over about six or seven minutes, finally she was right up side by side, touching her. And then leaned her head over on her shoulder. Oh. That's situational depression. It's trauma-induced depression. Yeah. And it was over. And we actually, as a church, we actually ended up painting the house, putting heat in it. We did a bunch of fun stuff that was kind of cool. So I got to watch her for a period of time. Come to find out she spoke a lot of English. <laughs> she got her first job ever, got a driver's license, and she flourished. But had I let her go for the first three days, she would have been dead. <clears throat> Uh, the people around her, they heard what we said, they understood it, but that situational depression, it came and it went. And I need you to think about that. So when you're talking with people, we're talking about suicide, what that means is sometimes there's no warnings. There's no warning. There are no indicators. Uh, I was at a school and uh, they'd had three suicides in a row and the principal after we had responded the third time said, I need you to talk to our staff. I said, gladly. They said, the staff isn't doing well. I pulled the staff in and I said, you have a program in the schools here. And the program slogan is, every suicide is preventable. And I want to tell you that's a lie. It's not true. Every suicide is not preventable. If I know, if you give me the indicators, and there's 12 different indicators we can look at, three stages that are commonly taught. If I know those, if you want me to know, if you show those things, then I can get involved and I believe we could probably make a major difference. But if you have a situational crisis and you don't tell anybody and move immediately to suicide, how can I stop that? I don't even know about it. 
Uh, we had a young lady who was suicided because there was uh, accusations of an older man who had molested her, who she was a friend with, and she was supposed to talk with her parents that night, and she killed herself. That's situational depression. How can anybody know? I mean, they know there's a tough conversation. Should every tough conversation be predicated upon the fact that suicide's a possibility? Well, then suicide's a possibility every single day of our lives, because there's a lot of tough conversations. So I, I, it, what I needed to tell that staff and what I need to tell you, and I need you to hear this from me, is not every suicide is preventable. They're not all knowable. And what's happening in a lot of the school districts is they're telling the kids, you can prevent every suicide. Whoa. That's, that's a lot of burden on a foundation that's untrue. It's untrue. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Miller, he's uh, taught over 7 million high school students in a program called Dare to Live. Mike said he was at a, a stadium and he was talking with a group of kids and afterwards a cheerleading captain president of the school came up. She was a really nice young lady, just nonchalant. He said, man, I so appreciate you coming in and talking to the whole school like this. It means so much and it helps him. And, you know, um, yeah, I just, I, I'm, I'm going to kill myself today. And he's like, what? You can't do that. And, and she just nonchalant, just... Nothing going on. And he said, what are, you, what are you saying? She goes, it's just too much. I can't keep this up. I can't keep this up with everybody. He says, well, who knows? Have you talked to your friends? No. Do your friends have? No. Have you indicated to anybody that you're in trouble? No, I just, I'm just done. Well, how do you prevent that suicide? And, and I, I need to tell you this as chaplains. You cannot take responsibility for somebody else's decision. Especially when they don't give you anything to work with. And even if they do give you something to work with, you still don't get to decide for them. So when we talk about the conversations of suicide, the first thing I have to tell you is if you are going to be putting yourself in a position to take responsibility for somebody else's actions, quit doing this work. You can't carry that burden and it's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. Let it go. Walk away. But if you're going to deal with suicide, you might lose some people. Some people you do all the right things with. And you might lose some people that you had no idea where she was at. And you have to go ahead and make the decision now to not take responsibility for somebody else's decision. Situational depression is real. I think it's one of the reasons chaplaincy is so important. When we help people with their trauma and their powerful experiences, we lessen the potential that they will come to a point of hopelessness. We're there. Somebody cared. Somebody connected them. So really important in suicidology, I think you have to understand, break them up into two categories. And people with situational depression tend to be more aggressive in their, their means. Okay? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have you break up again into groups of three. And there's an article, if you just look back uh, to page four, and you're going to read this together. Suicide premeditated versus impulsive. Uh, from beyond the blue, and then we're going to come back and discuss it, but I'm, I can only give you about seven minutes, so whoever's a speed reader in your group, sped red. Let's do it. Another impulse 
If you have a thought about this or a question about this, now would be a great time to speak loud and try to let the rest of the group hear from me. What did you think in that article? Anything new? Anything that really stuck out to you or a question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, right after they made the attempt and it, was failed, it didn't work, they were glad they had the bus. Yeah. I mean, multiple cases. Yeah, multiple cases, and we're going to watch a video on that. You're going to actually listen to a guy named Kevin Hines. This is a pretty famous video on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, I think it's a good one for you. But yeah, multiple, multiple people have said uh, in situational depression and clinical depression that the minute they attempted, they regretted their decision. Mm -hmm. um, I have a daughter who uh, served four tours in Iraq, and she had multiple suicide attempts from some pretty heavy trauma. And each time she would try to do it, she'd always call me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so four, four different times, yeah, we, she's still alive to this day. Uh, because they don't really want to die, they just don't want to keep living the way they're living now, and they don't think there's another alternative. You should know that. That statement should be in your mind. People don't really want to die, they just don't want to keep living the way they're living now, and they don't think there's an alternative. And so... Um, do know that when we're talking with people who are suicidal, most of them, they really don't want to die. There are some who really do just do want to die. Most people don't. They just want to live differently and they don't think they can. Other thoughts? Or statements? Yes? Sometimes but more and more states are accepting physician-assisted dying. And um, so I asked the question of physicians, I shared it at lunch today, but it can be asked of any, anyone, do you know for a fact that suffering ends at death? Yeah. I, and I, I don't hear that yeah. coming from other places. But It's a great question. But that's a question to, we can ask in our, in our uh, churches and so on, because it's really very different from the whole uh, Judeo-Christian perspective. Do you know for a fact that suffering ends? Yeah. Thank you. That's that's, that's a great. A good 
It's a great question. I like stimulating questions for sure. Mm -hmm. In the right places for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw this, uh, Canada has been pushing uh, pretty hard for... Um, oh, Canada has been pushing pretty hard recently for assisted suicide of people with uh, mental or uh, physical disabilities. And so it's starting to look a lot more like what we have seen under conditions in World War II and unfortunately the value of life that is brought up in culture from governments also can give people the message that suicide is a viable option for suffering. And that's, while people are still alive, there's still hope for that. I mean, we can, we can still work there, right? So uh, I, I would challenge those statements that do know that the culture is pushing that. Anybody else? Thoughts, statements? Yes. If many people say it affects so many people yeah. when somebody does commit suicide. Yeah, the ripple effect of suicide. Many people say it affects so many people when somebody commits suicide. And I would really agree with that statement. Uh, one of the courses we do we actually have people uh, sit down on the course and we say, would you please write out a list of everybody who, if you died today, would be directly affected by you? And I think it's a really good exercise for people when they're you know, not suicidal and things of that nature in advance because what they start to realize is the circle is bigger than they think. Uh, and, it, and it really does impact. And suicide comes with a lot more questions than answers. And you know the, the old TV part, and I know most of you know this, you don't get a lot of suicide months. That's not what we get. We get a lot of suicides with very few notes. And so the answers are they're just not going to be there. Yeah. I was told in my psychiatric hospital that the new language is you cannot say commit suicide. Completely. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. It, it has too much of a religious context to it, so we don't use the word commit. Yeah, you know, and, and here's the thing about language. So we've become wordsmiths to a point where I think we're a little bit in trouble. Like, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder was, you know, in the DSM-5, they wanted to name it PTSI. Because disorder uh, sounds too negative and injury sounds better. The thing is, nobody would adopt it. Nobody did it. I mean, I, I suppose there's some places that do it, but by and large, it doesn't happen. So, you know, uh, committed suicide or completed suicide is what I hear is the most uh, common language. And, and, I mean, I certainly want to be sensitive to people. I, I really do. Uh, but we've come to a point where I think with language, we have to be super cautious also about following the culture too far in a direction, and we should have a real reason behind it. We should have a real reason. I mean, like, what is the reason? Um, I, I, so my, uh, when I came to the Lord, I was suicidal. I was a meth user. Decided the best thing I could do is kill myself. And uh, so I have personal experience with suicide, and then met Jesus and got saved radically. And I was a very functioning user, was an international coach, traveled. Uh, my mom has attempted suicide. We grew up in a new age family. She's uh, attempted multiple times. Uh, and by the grace of God is alive, my daughter. So I can tell you I'm in a family where a lot of suicide came in because of all the dark and demonic things that came in in the new age uh, culture with us. And uh, we're all believers now. Jesus is still king. And you can say committed or completed or attempted or tried to kill ourselves or none of us. It's all the same to me, personally, but I certainly do want to, if somebody said to me, could you not say committed, could you say completed, I would say absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts here before we move on? Yes, sir. Yes, I'll come back to you next. Yes. I just wondered if you have people that commit suicide with, um, you know, before, in front of other people. Yeah. Is, is there just statistics as to why they have done that or... Well, why they've committed suicide in front of other people? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a really great question. I don't know that I have the answer to that question, but I will tell you that most suicides are not uh, to injure somebody, but some are. Yeah. Uh, most suicides are not to injure right. people. Um, a lot of times people who are attempting suicide or contemplating suicide are actually thinking that their absence would make other people's lives better. That was my own case. Um, I know that's the case with most people. They think it would be better if they took their problems out of your life. Um, but we do, we have those suicides too where, you know, we uh, called for a bar out in the country where a guy shot himself and we, all of his friends were sitting at the table and he shot himself. And just recently we had one uh, where a bunch of uh, uh, teenage kids driving through a Taco Bell at 2 a.m. in the morning in a local community were in the car ordering food. One of them took out a gun and shot himself in the car. Wow. 
And, and how do you answer that question? I, I, I don't know. Did, it, no. did he want people to know his pain? Did he just want to be with his... I don't know. I, I, and I don't know statistically we have those answers because they kind of die with the person. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, so most people don't want to die. They just don't want to live the way they are now. And they don't think there's another alternative. And that's the area we get to work in is they don't think there's another alternative. We are the other alternative. I care. I'm here. Things can change. We can go about this a different way. It's not overnight, but I can work with you. Would you work with me? That's the part we work in. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to uh, do ministry in Yes, sir. And uh, I found that uh, if I would have chocolate uh, patients read Psalms 139, the last two, 20, verse 23 and 23, uh, 24 and, uh, 23 and 24, to read that several times, mm -hmm. have them read the whole chapter after that. And the time I came back next time, they told me thank you. I'm okay now. <laughs> so we may want to think about that as we are ministering as, as chaplains. You know, yeah. we, have, we have to do scripture. Yeah. Where you can, you should. Amen. Where it's an open door and, and, and you can do that, I, I think we should. Um, I'll, I'll tell you just on a very quick side note, like law enforcement agencies, I told you I train a lot of them. Uh, as I'm training them, I will say to them, okay, so part of your peer support team is you've got to have the theology of suffering. Yours can be different than mine. You know that I'm a chaplain, so I'll just give you an example. Here's my example of the theology of suffering. And I talk about, well, you know, the fall. And I talk about Jesus' salvation. I mean, I just give them a five-minute quick blurb. And I say, so I understand that I live in a fallen world, but one day it's going to give way. There's no more tears, no more sickness, no more death. So that's my theology of suffering. As an example, can you tell me yours? And you, you if they don't share... My theology of suffering, most of them have no answer at all. Uh -huh. And if they have an answer, you can tell they're very unsatisfied with their answer. <laughs> um, so I think creativity, but talking about the theology of suffering and just saying as an example, but I'm really curious about what yours is and how will you work with suffering and answer the questions of suffering. Because it's a, like you, you can open the Bible, I can't do that in the police department when I'm training them, but I can give them little questions. What I did is that I'm testing to start and they go back and have them understand that yeah. they are in a wonderful way. Yeah. And they need to accept that so they can begin to feel. Yeah. Yeah, amen. I, I would say scripture has power. Yes, sir. Well, uh, this is a little information. Of, uh, yeah. Uh, one of the federal government uh, agents, uh, SAMHSA, uh, recently uh, uh, reported saying the suicide is growing since COVID-19. Yeah. So they are providing a historical high uh, budget now. But what I'm interested in is they mentioned about situational and psychological problems. But now they started to begin to mention about spiritual thirst. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. So even the ICISF, uh, yeah. the group that I have a lot of training through, um, uh, Jeff Mitchell, who I really respect and appreciate, great work. Uh, I remember the first class I came to take as an approved instructor, and uh, I'm Pastor Rob Lloyd, and so he immediately said, so pastor, huh? I'm like, yes. And he goes, okay, at best I'm a lapsed Catholic. And I'm like, that's all right, God can work with that, let's keep going. And so, uh, so we, we had some push and pull back and forth, and what we've noticed is even in the time that I've been a part of ICISF, uh, they say, we have to do more to work with spiritual leaders, with the church and with chaplains because they're the number one responders we have. And so I, I totally agree. SAMHSA, which, uh, again, if you are a part of the FEMA departments or you're looking at anything for the mental health capacity of FEMA and SAMHSA, um, you're right. They're, they're all having to look because who are the people showing up and continue to show up, the people of God. Okay, one more question that I'm going to get cooking here. At some point in my conversations with people that survived uh, suicide attempts, they asked me to pray for them. Yeah. Okay, so starting, I, I do ask 
made comments about their personal self-worth, and I thank them for trusting me yeah. with their uh, most Wisdom. intimate feelings. Mm -hmm. And I moved from there, but I wanted to know what you think about that and, and how to enter into prayer. Oh, I think it's so wise. So, um, and, and I'm going to say this with great caution, and because I realize we can have different sort of opinions, but I want you to hear mine. Um, and if you debate this with me, we could talk about that, hopefully friendly. So I had a law enforcement officer call me and say, hey, look, we just went to a hotel, and we had um, two ladies who were married, and uh, both of them have some mental health issues. They got in a fight. They split. One of them went to the hotel. Uh, we were just called by staff because she hung herself uh, from the closet rod, which I still have never figured out, by the way. Um, but it was, it was a strong will to die. So I'm talking with the other uh, lady who uh, was married to her on the phone. Uh, we, it was during COVID, and so I couldn't be face to face with her. And I said, hey, um, I'm a chaplain. I was asked to call you. And she said, well, are you a Christian? I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. And she goes, I'm not. And I said, you know what? I can respect that. You get to choose who you are at this point. Uh, obviously, I bet you wish you could change my worldview, and I bet I wish I could change yours. But right now, you know what's really important? That I love you, and you're in pain. Mm -hmm. Would you let me love on you just a little bit? And she's like, well, yeah. We talk for an hour. And at the end of the conversation, I had said to her, I said, you know what? When we hang up the phone to be all honest, I'm going to be praying for you. But before I hang up, would you, even though you don't believe in the same Jesus I do, because I am going to pray, and I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus, because I believe he's the only one who can save, and he is God, and there is no other, and there's no other answer. Amen. So I'm giving you the opportunity to pray with me, but you need to know that's where I'm going. I don't want to hide that from you mm -hmm. at all. I want you to know that. So would you like me to pray with you or pray by myself? And she goes, sir, you care, and right now I need the help. Let's ask your God. And I got to pray with her. And we just had the most amazing prayer. So exactly what you're saying. I think just be up front mm -hmm. and tell them, you know, and respect them. Respect them. Because, you know, we were in like manner, lost until we, you know. Yeah, so I, I think it's really important. Give them the opportunity. If they say no, say, hey, I totally respect that. And I care. I'm so glad I could do anything that maybe this would be important for you and for me. So really important. Respect people, Amen. but I don't think that that means you you have to hang up your faith at the door mm -hmm. or what your belief system is. I don't think you have to do that. We can disagree, and right now what we're hearing is you can't disagree because if you disagree, you're intolerant. No, I just disagree, and and I think we can do that. So we need to be able to have that kind of communication in that language, and love people who think differently than we do. Just love them, you know. Mm -hmm. Until they ask why. Okay, so I, we're going to move, and I'm going to watch this video with you guys real quickly, and then I we're going to have like ten more minutes. And I'm, I've got it there on page uh, two in the middle. The first is confirm. You've got to ask the person. So you're having a conversation with them, and you hear the theme of hopelessness. You know, you see some situational depression after they've lost somebody or a diagnosis or something powerful. Um, and what I would say to you is if you've never asked anybody before in your life if they're considering killing themselves, you need to practice that. You just need to practice it. You know, I, I remember I teach a whole course on death notifications of all different kinds, you know, to groups, to families, to individuals, somebody who has somebody, somebody who doesn't have anybody. So we do a lot of death notifications. And I'll tell you, the first time everybody runs through that course, uh, there's a lot of tears. And they're fake death notifications. I mean, we break up in groups and role play. They're not, they're not even real. They're death notifications, but there's a lot of ears. Uh, because it, it forces you to face the reality that the people that you love are going to die, or it brings up the memory of some of those deaths. And so even popping the question in a role play is kind of challenging for some people because they just haven't done it. I doubt that's the situation for you. I think you've all done it many times. Um, but I will say that with suicide, some people have never asked somebody that question. And this is how it shouldn't sound. I have an impression you want to hurt yourself. Why wouldn't I say it that way? It's not direct. Um, let, let me tell you this really quickly. Well, I don't do anything quickly. I say it really quickly all the time as an illusion to myself, and I'm actually going to say something. Like that. It doesn't really happen. Um, when we talk about uh, cutting, do you remember the trends of cutting? It still happens, but it's not the same numbers. Have you ever noticed that? Cutting has gone way down. What's it been replaced by? 
Tattooing. Yes. Tattooing. Uh, so we used to have cutting injuries all the time. And what, is, what was cutting? It's an, an outward expression of an inward pain. Mm -hmm. Nobody can see it. When you got a broken leg, everybody <laughs> knows that, right? But when you're hurting inside, how does anybody see it? Well, cutting was an outward expression of an inward pain, and sometimes it was actually the need to feel a physical pain for an emotional pain. So cutting, was it always indicative of suicide? No. There are a lot of people who are cutters who are very continual cutters who never had suicidal ideation at all. And what happened is tattooing became very popular, and I was teaching a group of nurses in a training that one of the ICISF, and I brought that up, and she's like, that is so stupid. And I'm like, you think so? Let's have an experiment. Let's go to lunch. We went to lunch. We're out at Ikea. There's a pregnant lady working at Ikea. She's got tattoos all up and down her arm. And I'm like, I walked over and I said, hey, we were having a conversation that tattoos really kind of tell a trauma history or an importance of history. And you have a lot of really great tattoos. I mean, they're amazing. Would you tell me? Anything about you? No, I'm not going to tell you about my tattoos. They're very personal. But this was when my son was born. This is when my mom died. I mean, she went through. She just, she read her story off of her body. And she just read it to me. And they're all like, I'm like, I'm telling you, if you want a door to open the gospel to somebody, walk up to somebody who's got a lot of tattoos and say, you know what? I do talk, trauma work. And I, I've been told recently at a clinic that tattooing is an outward expression of inward pain or, a or people's trauma stories and their victories. Is that true on some of your tattoos? Because you have some amazing artwork. And I'll tell you what, you'll have some intimate conversations with people very quickly. Um, they, they are trying to tell you what's going on. They're trying. Now, some of them are just artwork. Don't get, and not everybody. But I'm going to say that there's a lot of people, their, their tattoos are their story. Okay? Would you say that everybody who has a lot of tattoos is suicidal? No. So when you're going to talk to somebody who's suicidal and you're going to pop the question, what you need to say is, hey, I'm hearing language or kind of a sentiment in you that sounds like you might be considering killing yourself. Taking your life. Be direct. Don't beat around the bush. Don't try to soften the question. It doesn't serve a purpose here. It's just kind of like when you do a death notification. You said dead, died, or killed. That, that's acceptable. Gone onto the other side of the Great River is probably not going to work. <laughs> now, don't, don't do that. that. That's not helpful. You need to be direct. Well, same thing with asking the qu question of suicide. Hey, uh, because I care and I'm listening, it sounds like I'm hearing you come up with a sentiment that you're really considering uh, killing yourself or taking your life. Not hurting yourself, not harming yourself. Because you can hurt and harm yourself and not want to die at all. So ask the question. Confirm. And then contradict, and contradict is where the real work comes in. Um, it doesn't mean engage in an argument with them. It, it, you know, remember, it's just an acronym to kind of keep you going. Contradict is to start to find their contact to life, reasons to live, uh, what they think the outcome will be. Well, if I die, everybody else will, you know, they'll be better off. Can I tell you statistically what I know about suicide and the families that it impacts? And you tell them, you let them know. Not what I've understood. I understood if somebody dies, let's say, of a natural death, like, and the grieving is a year, suicide's always three years. It's going to be three times longer. That's what I know about suicide. I've worked with a lot of suicide families, what you believe is going to happen is actually not going to happen the way you think. It's going to be much harder. So you should really change your thinking about that because it's actually not correct thinking. I appreciate your heart of caring for people, but if I told you the experiences that I've had with people who've survived somebody else's suicide, I want you to know that that won't be easier. Contradict. Um, or contradict the fact, you know, most people don't want to die. They just don't want to keep living the way they're living now, and they don't think they have any other outcome. Say, but you've never had me on your team. And I'm one of those strange people that talk about death, dying, rape, murder, suicide, and killing. I actually train for this, and I want to help you figure that out. I want to help you figure out how to live differently. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. It's just not going to happen overnight. It took a while to get here. Give me a chance to help you see that there is an alternative to the way you're living now. And so I need the next 30 days. That's the D. Delay. Make a deal now. This is where you're cutting a deal. Your negotiator skills have to come out. Because I always shoot for 30 days and sometimes they're like, 30 days? I'll give you a week. I say, well, you know, if we're, if we're making a deal, I should get two weeks. Oh, okay, you get two weeks. Okay, so for two weeks. 
and you cut a deal, and then when the, the week's up, then you renew your contract. You know, but the thing is, you have to show that you know, there's actually some partners, some different ways to approach it. It doesn't even mean you have to fix all their problems. It's just simply saying, you know, we're going to contradict the outcome, and now I need some time to help you see that you could live a different life than you're living now. But you got to work with me. Now, could they say no to all that? Yeah. Could they lie to you and say they're going to? Yeah. Can you control that? No. Does that mean you shouldn't bother? No. I did this with my mom. Um, after her first suicide, I'm like, Mom, you have no idea. You have no idea how this is going to impact us. You're wrong. She thought it would be easier for my sister and I. I said, absolutely incorrect. Uh, I had to think about all the things that were going to be different, and I'm, I'm, I'm not okay. I'm still trying to recover from this. But I need you to guarantee me for the next 30 days there's going to be nothing that goes on until we get you some help. And we negotiated. I got my full 30 days because I'm the son and she likes me. <laughs> um, and in that 30 days, her life did change. It did change. And we were start able to make those. And I will tell you, it works. Um, more often than it fails, and I'd say way more in that 90 percentile, I've had a lot of people guarantee me they'll give me time, and I, I haven't had, actually I haven't had nobody in that period of time attempt suicide. Nobody. Um, so when you're working with people and you have that rapport, you should build it and you should use it. And then finally the R. So confirm, contradict, delay, and refer. Um, do you want to take this on as the full-time only person in this group? No. Even if this is what you do, um, what you want is what we call shared, li shared liability. You want to have multiple partners with you because, first of all, it covers you and it's a good covering on you, right? If you've got multiple players working with one person, you have multiple people to say, we've done everything we can. And if anybody was to say anything different, you've got shared liability. Number two, you've got shared energy, because it takes a lot of energy to work with people. Um, it takes a lot of time. And you don't need to know everything. You need to know what you've signed up to do, and you do that, and you need to know the people who do what you haven't signed up to do, and connect them. Partnerships matter. So referrals are big, and you want to know some of those referrals in advance, if it's for drug treatment, if it's for um, depression, and they actually need some serious counseling, uh, you want to know um, inpatient, outpatient systems, where that you can send them, uh, you might need to know some marital counseling, you, you, I mean you you got to figure out the resources that you're going to use and you want to have those in advance. But here's how I'm going to close, because my time, even though we started 10 minutes, so I'm going to let you out five minutes earlier, sorry, sorry, like, here's the question I want to ask you, and I'm really serious about this question, can you do this work? Can you do it? And you need to ask yourself that question because where you might check out is you, you showed up to be the chaplain, you showed up to deal with trauma, and now you're dealing with suicide, and you say, my kid's suicided. I can't, I can't do that. Okay, that's not a problem. Who are you going to hand off to? You know, some people, they've had a sexual assault history. It's been pretty graphic. Does it mean you can't be a chaplain because you, you don't want to do that? No. Who are you going to hand off to? Or domestic violence. Who are you going to hand off to? Some of your own depression or mental illness or suicide or who are you going to hand off to? Know the partners and the players can do the things that you do and don't do the things that you don't do. Yeah, because you have to be okay. You can't help anybody if you're not okay. So as we're talking about suicide, if this, if this whole thing has just made you queasy and you're like, Man, I can't wait till he's done. I wish this guy would stop talking. I'd like to leave the room. You probably should not do suicide work. You should probably figure out who close to you, who is the, the person or group that you're going to defer to. If on the other hand, you're like, wow, you know, some of those things, I can't wait to talk to so-and-so or to uh, train our group or to go back and then this is probably for you. Does that make sense? All right. Yes. One statement that I'm going to pray. Yeah. I understand the depression as a result of addiction, alcoholism. Yeah. Sure. Um, and I understand the point of despair. Sure. And it's not rational. Yeah. And you can't carry on a conversation. I could never have carried on a conversation with you. It would have made me even more angry. Yeah. That video. Uh -huh. would have been exactly what I would have 
wanted. There's a second thing. Richard brought up Psalm 139. Uh -huh. A very good preacher once preached on that and searched me, oh God, at the beginning of trying to hide from him. You know? yeah. And by the end, if the alcoholic or the addict can get that, yeah. by the end you can throw your arms open and say, search sure. me, oh God, yeah. and know my ways. It's absolutely yeah. It's 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 breathtaking. And the third thing is, I was sitting with one of the girls from the other group that is here. They are here for trauma free. Yeah. She was covered with tattoos. Yeah. That is the very first thing that I do with a patient. I read their tattoos because that tells me about them. Absolutely. And by the way, I wasn't suicidal, but I have tattoos. Yeah. I've got That's tattoos. <laughs> They're able to tell you about themselves in an abstract way. Yeah. And you cannot carry on a conversation when you're in that desperate situation. Yeah. You're not okay. I just. So I'm, I'm going to challenge you just a little bit. Okay. I was on meth when I came into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Alone at a campsite, stoned out of my mind for about 12 hours. Yep. Had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ and was saved. Yep. I came out of a restaurant with my wife, and there's this young guy, and we've been with another couple who were having dinner, and I see him, and he's standing over by the garbage can, and he has a razor blade in his hand leaning on the garbage can. So I walked over and began to talk with him, and he was hot. And I talked to him out of suicide at that moment. So I understand what you're saying. You can't have a rational conversation with an irrational person. I totally get that. But again, like you also mentioned, but Jesus can bridge any gap. Exactly. Amen. And I'm a pastor's kid. Yeah. I'm a pastor's wife. I can't get away from everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you might be surrounded by a few in here too. <laughs> yeah. But, oh. He has the tattoos to prove it. Too. Yes. <laughs> Okay, hey, what I'd like to do for you is I'm going to pray for you and then let you go. And I really want to thank you for sitting through what I know is powerful to some of you. Um, and again, if this has impacted you powerfully and you need some prayer, would you make sure you just come up and get some prayer or just talk with one of the other chaplains in the room? Um, because I know the subject is heavy and I know some of you this this is impacted. So if you allow me just to pray for you, let me go and I hope you get some rest today and do something good for you. The self-care part that we're really good telling everybody else to do that we don't do ourselves. <laughs> Lord God, I want to thank you for this subject, and I want to thank you for everything that's in the Word. I mean, as we look into your your Word, into the Bible, what you've given us, the subject of suicide is there. We see examples of it in the Bible. And you have covered everything. You have talked about everything, and you speak life and healing words over us. And we're so grateful, God. Uh, we don't have to run from anything because we know who we run to. And I just pray right now, Lord, in the midst of this conversation taking place here in this place today, that as we're trying to equip and figure out how to love people who might feel unlovable, who feel broken beyond uh, repair, who just don't know that there's another option, I, I just pray, Father, that you, as you're preparing this, would also wash us and cleanse us. And I always get that picture, Lord, of the Old Testament priests who would go in and very specifically, they put on that inner white garment, clean, white, perfect. And by the end of the day, they'd be covered in the blood of other people's sins from head to toe, saturated. As other people would come and make their offerings before you for sin. And uh, I can't imagine a single one of those took those clothes and wore them home and sat down to have dinner with their family. And yet, Lord, sometimes we do that very thing. We take the sins of the world and the, or even our own sins and sins that might have been done against other people that have caused them to despair. And Sometimes, Lord, we forget to change our clothes. We forget that you say, come to me and let me wash you and bathe you. And Lord, we do. We just come before you right now, all of us, and we just say, Lord, wash us, cleanse us, make us white as snow again, dress us again prepared in that white crisp garment ready to serve you and to enjoy each other and to enjoy our family. Lord, if there's any brokenness in us right now in this place, we just want to surrender it and hand it to you because you're the one who knows what to do with it. And we thank you that you entrust us with your most valued possession, which is other people. And we just ask God that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you give us the ability to do that in a way that honors you and speaks life. 
And we just want to thank you now. And we give you all the praise and glory, Lord. Whatever pride could be in any of us for anything we've ever been a part of or know, Lord, we just ask that you forgive us. And we surrender it. And we humbly come and just crawl up in your lap and say, Lord, we're homesick. We'd love to be home. But we're so grateful that you got us on mission now. Equip us and fill us again. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.